in, a ver in various times of the week and also facilitated small group and large group match meetings as well. And then let's not forget the other side of that, which is where our mentors come from. Um, I've done work site mentors, college mentors, uh, faith-based mentors, high school mentors, and then just your community at large. So there's a lot of um, depth to the experience that I have, and I'm really hoping that today that we cover some of that for you and get a sense of um, giving you what you might feel as a basic element to go out and build those partnerships. But then also, um, if you feel like there's something that you had a question about or you were hoping that you were going to get out of the session, please don't hesitate um, to ask the question as it comes to you. Um, as Katie shared, there is a chat box off to the side that you can put your question in as it comes to you. And um, Katie will either let me know as we go and interrupt me so that we can answer the question as we're there, or we'll, we'll definitely get to all those questions at the very end. So today we're going to cover um, some things that I hope that you get out of this session is knowing your potential school partner, evaluating the fit of your program to the potential school that you're looking at going to, how to have a successful meeting, you know, how to get that partnership started, and then importantly, how to maintain your partnership. And then I'll give you a sense, uh, some resources to look to for additional information, and then at the very end, we'll take all of your questions and make sure we cover that. So I do have a question for all of you who have joined us today. And um, we have a poll for you. We want to know how many school partnerships your program has now. Do you have none? Do you have one, two to five, five to ten, or more than ten? And you can just go ahead and select the one that best fits your program. Eighty-eight percent of the attendees have voted, and I will share the results. Okay, so we've got about fourteen percent of you uh, don't have any programs. Another fourteen have one. Um, fourteen of you have about two to five. Uh, fourteen percent of you have five to ten, and then it, it looks like almost half of everybody that's on um, has uh, forty has more than ten partnerships. Um, Katie, I'm going to go off script for a second here. Um, those of you that have more than 10 partnerships, um, if, could you share with me a little bit what, um, what you're hoping to get out of today's session or what, um, you know, are you instrumental in, how do we go this direction? Are you instrumental in building those partnerships or are you actually on so you can learn how to um, expand your partnerships and maybe pull, bring some more schools on site? And you can just type that right over into the chat box. We have one participant who said they are interested in strengthening their current relationships. Great. Um, another said we're looking how to better maintain our partnerships in schools that we don't have a strong presence in and also to create new ones. Okay, great. That gives me a great sense to make sure that we, we will definitely cover those elements for folks. So um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, um, I just want to kind of go over what is a commonly accepted definition for school-based mentoring. And that's typically school-based mentoring is a K through 12, a K through 12 student is paired with an adult from the community or an older, usually high school student in a supportive one-to-one -one relationship at the school site. I also want to keep in mind that some programs may match up more than one mentee with a mentor, and it's really common for multiple one-to-one -one matches to meet as a group, and I think those are those still kind of fit within this um, definition. And then the times of the day for the meetings may vary, uh, you know, maybe before school, at lunch, during school, after school, uh, but the commonality here is that we're, these matches are actually meeting at uh, a school site, and that can also be a sense of kind of a structured mentoring program. So 
we want to talk about considerations for working with schools, you really want to become familiar with the school's culture, their policies, and procedures. And be sure that your mentors are aware and sensitive to the school culture. You also want to understand going into a school relationship that the school staff and the administrators may have had negative experiences with previous outside programs. Even though that's not your program, they'll bring that into the mix when working with you. You want to be aware of the existence of other outside programs in the school. And you can use this to show how your program may, be, may provide different outcomes and impact. If there's a similar program, maybe even the students you plan to serve are, are being underserved or not being served in their particular program. You want to consider providing a staff presence from your program at the school as often as your resources will allow. And remember that the program requires three-way communication among your organization, the school, and the mentor. You want to address and resolve problems as soon as they arise. This is so critical to the success of your program in a school setting, so be prepared for that. And remember that partnerships between organizations often depend on particular individuals within each organization. So work to build your partnership between the school and your program. And be flexible and prepared for staff changes at the school. Be sure to keep up with those changes and outreach to new personnel to introduce them to your program. It sometimes will feel like you're starting over, but it's really good to get in there and meet them and let them know what you do and that you're so excited to work with them. And then be prepared for staff changes in your own program as well. And the critical piece with all this is communication. That's really key to kind of keeping all of that going. So how do you get to know your school and your district? It's time to do your homework. Um, getting to know a little bit about the school and the school district before you meet can be really helpful. You can check out the school district online. And you can check out your school online. It's very common for them to have two separate sites. And just read everything you can find. Click on the event calendars, the newsletters. Um, sometimes when you're on the district site, there'll be board minutes or policies about volunteers, procedures about volunteers. A lot of that stuff is very public and out there for you to kind of look at and dig into. And another great site to check out is the Michigan School Report Card. And I have the website up here for you. Um, this is where you can check for the district and the school's AYP, which is their annually, annual yearly progress. And um, you can see whether the school that you're working with would be considered high need or need additional resources, because typically it will say that they did not meet the AYP. And the AYP is a host of uh, a variety of things that the State Department of Education is looking for that school to have. Um, some of it is tied into the meet scores. That, that come out, but there are other factors that go into that, and you can read all about that on that website and identify whether you're, you know, just do your homework, check into your school, and see if that's something that they um, are needing or not needing. And for longer matches, you want a sense of when students transition to the next school. Know the grades that, that are at the school you're going to and when and where they'll go next. And once you have your primary school program started, it's really compelling to go to the next principal and the school up to continue the benefits of the match relationship into the next grade and the new school. It's really easy to sell that mentoring is great for students transitioning into new environments and that you're trying to maintain a relationship that already exists. Sometimes from the website, you'll even be able to tell what programs are already at the school. So try, try to find those and check out. Um, you can kind of go to the sections that might say resources for parents and see what other programs might be there. You've probably all heard this one before about finding a champion for the school that's connected to the school. And you might be able to find them already connected to your program. It may be a current mentor who um, is involved with the school, maybe as a parent to the school or went to the school, um, a board member, or even a connection through a co coworker. So don't forget your peers that you work with. They may be somewhat connected to schools. And you can talk with your champion a little bit more about the culture of the school. Um, you know, what's kind of the general vibe of the school? Is the principal really kind of strict um, or are they laid back? What kind of general personality do they have? How do they interact with the students? Um, are, you know, do they follow every rule and dot every I and cross every T? Um, or are they a little bit more laid back? The other thing you can find out is what pressures 
might be going on with the school. What are they really pushing to get to um, and excel to? And you find out you have um, magnet schools that you might be meeting with that you didn't even know it was a magnet school or schools that are consolidating or closing. Those are all important things to kind of get to know. You cannot forget to connect with the school counselor or the secretary. Learn more about the school. What's parental involvement like? That will give you a sense of what the culture of the school is like as well. What's important to the principal and the staff? What expectations have been handed down to them from the district or the school board? And then you'll also be able to find out what other programs they have that may not have made it onto the website. So you'll find in some schools their website's not always as current as what may be going on in the actual school that year. But you have to be alert to potential turf issues. Um, you may find someone in the school with influence who has a favorite program. Um, sometimes schools have access grant money through the Department of Education to provide very similar programs and have chose current staff to implement those programs. A lot of times they will bump up the salary of a teacher um, if they are interested or willing to kind of help out with a particular program. So sometimes they've written mentoring into other grants that they have, so you have to be really careful when you go in um, that you're not kind of trying to push someone else's program out the door as you're walking in. We're going to spend a little bit of time here really talking about your own program design. And this may seem very common sense to think about all of this, but what I want to share with you is this is really an area that you want to have well thought out before you go in for your meeting. You really want to think through and rethink through all of these elements to your program and have some discussions about or some thoughts about where are your flexibilities. Where, where can your program be flexible and still meet its goals? So um, think through your program design for school-based mentoring. Does it fit as it is, or are you going to need to consider some program adjustments to make it fit? And what are your program goals, and are those going to fit into a school-based model as well? Arrive with the flexibility when you meet with the school administration. Sometimes a tweak to your program design will get you in the school. Sometimes it will make your program more effective so you can reach more kids. Uh, or even more convenient for your mentors. And I have a personal story to share about um, I was doing some outreach to an area where we had a Lunch Buddies program going on in the middle school. And we were looking at how would we serve more youth in that community and wanted to explore uh, kind of reaching out to the high school and getting some high school mentors involved because we knew if we went to the elementary school, that would be a great way to expand that base um, of kids that we were serving. And um, I went out to meet with the principal, and this was one of those schools where um, the, sec the kindergartners and first graders were at one school, and the second through fifth graders were at another school. And went and talked to the principal, um, wanted to see, um, there was an open campus at the high school, so those high school students, when they had lunch, they could actually go off, go off campus. And so we're, I wanted to first look at Lunch Buddies format. And um, as I was talking with the principal, he mentioned that the high school actually got out earlier than the elementary schools and that he would be open to his second and third graders actually using that end of the day of their school day to be mentored. And I just thought that was so, um, so wonderful for him to offer that up. It actually provided a bigger block of time for these mentors to actually meet with the mentees. And with just being able to be flexible with that and adjust, uh, we definitely were able to serve more kids. And it was just amazing that the principal was willing to be flexible and actually give some time out of the day. Um, I didn't go in asking for that, but that's what he put on the table as a preference. And it ended up working out wonderfully. When you go in to start your program, you also want to make sure that you're building it so that there's a focus on longer, stronger matches for those positive youth outcomes. So it's really important to consider a multi-year model. That's where I talked about know when the grades, when they transition to the next school, and, and be prepared to build those relationships as well when you go into a particular school system so that you can keep those matches going for as long as you possibly can. You also want to highlight existing educational objectives. Show how your program is going to help achieve the school's educational objectives. So one of the details to work out is which students will you mentor? 
Um, you need to think about the student's needs and how they accompany your program goals, and specifically, what are your program goals? Which students are you going to reach out to? What are the risk factors you're looking for, particular grade levels? I know the Department of Education grants that had come out previously, they started with fourth graders. Um, you know, so if you've got funding tied to certain grades, be sure to put that out on the table. How are you going to get those students referred? Are you going to look at a teacher referral process? Uh, are you planning on doing a parent meeting? Which I can share with you depending on, this is why it's important to know what the parental involvement is in the school that you're going to. Um, I've had some schools where the principals had a parent meeting phenomenal attendance, got all the parents there that were going to be, their kids were going to be in the program, worked out great. That's how his school ran. I've gone to other schools in very urban inner city schools, and you have a parent meeting and one or two parents show up. And so your intent and all your good plans don't really net you out what you're looking for. You can look at open houses as a possibility, um, but know that in some schools, those are not necessarily the kids that you really, really want to connect with and get, get to because um, those parents are working during those times that those open houses are or are unavailable or just don't have transportation to get back to the school for that. Parent newsletter, there might be one electronically or there might be one that goes home with the kids. That's another way to reach out with your program. Think about how you're going to enroll, interview, intake, you know, whichever language you use in your program, how you're going to how you're going to bring the students into your program. What information do you need from the student to make a good match? And how long will the interview last? And will you do those during the school day? It's really good to make sure you're thinking through that and how long they're going to be. And how are you going to inform and get consent from the parents? And I highly, highly recommend that you make sure you get parental consent. Um, this is a great way to get permission for them to be in the program, but also to get a signed release so you can get student information if you're going to use that for your evaluation. Um, are you going to have a parent orientation? Um, a lot of programs use permission type forms. I think that's a great mechanism to use in our school-based setting. Parents are very used to those permission slips going home, um, signing them and sending them back. Uh, are you going to have an application as a part of that process so that you can get additional information from the parents? And keep in mind, if you're going into a school where there might be um, some language diversities, um, there are some schools in, in Lansing where there is Swahili and um, a variety of other languages that I stumbled across when I was there. Uh, the parents will sign the permission slips because they want their kids to be in the program, but then connecting with the parents if you need to um, can kind of somewhat be a challenge because there is a language barrier there. Uh, one thing I can encourage you to do is you can reach out to your department of DHS um, in your local area, so the Department of Human Services, and they will have translators that you may be able to get access to so that you can bridge that gap if you need to. Um, it's a great opportunity if you're going to do consent forms also to share a little bit more information about your program and what infor whatever format you use to get the consent. And just you know, informing parents about your program is so beneficial. Also think about how many students you want to serve. You know, what's the initial size and scope of your program? And you can really highlight the significance of your program when you might want to approach it that way. Uh, I worked with a very high needs school um, in the Detroit public school system. And because our work site was so excited to get in and work with this particular school, we were actually able to recruit enough mentors to mentor an entire fourth grade class for a year. Um, that was about 32 matches. And that was amazing. Um, so, so having a goal of size can impact your other program elements. For example, you know, we had all of those matches meet together at the same time. That can be a challenge if you have space that you need for all of them to be together. You know, you're putting 64 people in one room and whatever staff you have there to support it. And sometimes our schools are really challenged for things like that. So really think through that when you're designing your program. And of course, on the other end, we want to talk about mentor sources. It's really beneficial to identify a source for each school prior to your meeting. You may not necessarily go out and recruit, but you, you want to be able to recruit from them as soon as you have the partnership established in order to meet your program goals and the expectations of the school. So think about who's going to serve as mentors. And believe it or not, proximity is still important when you're considering where your mentors will be recruited from. 
the closer to the school site they are, the longer the matches will be. And because mentors who are stretched for time to get to the site will often state this as a reason for match closure. So you want to look for mentors who might work close to that site if you're doing it during the day or it's somewhere near they, you know, somewhere near where they live um, if you're doing like an after school or before school program. Um, I had worked on a partnership with DTE and uh, the executive who we built the work partnership with um, chose a specific school site because they were also on a school board and that was in her particular area. And we discussed this, even though the school site was quite a distance from the work site, she was really adamant that that was a school that needed mentoring the most. And it started out strong, but the mentors started to end their matches early, and many came back to us with, you know, it's time constraints, the cost of gas, there were more demands on them that, at work, and this was even though it was company supported, um, they, were, they were starting to have shorter lunches, and, and we lost even more mentors into the next school year. It was really difficult to keep that, um, that partnership going. So here's some sources to consider is you might have mentors already in your program. And I know we're not, probably not talking about male mentors necessarily, um, but if you have mentors that haven't been matched, uh, programs I've always worked with had more female mentors, um, consider asking those that live, work, that live or work near the school site about their interests, about going into a school-based program. Corporate or work site volunteers are great if you have an opportunity to do that. Look and see if the school's been adopted by a business and consider schools that are close to the business location. You can also look at service clubs like Lions, Optimus. Many of those groups have lunch meetings and are good candidates for like lunch buddies or lunch match meetings because they're, they're very focused on youth development. Retirees or senior citizen volunteers, they're also a great resource for schools and many prefer match meetings at a site that they're comfortable with. They're more comfortable going into the school um, and many of them shy away from your community-based program due to fears of youth possibly being in their home. Um, and they also appreciate the structure of the school-based mentoring program will bring to them. College volunteers, again, if there's a campus nearby, great resource for schools. Very important to consider both school schedules when you're looking at this resource to maximize your match length. It's even better for school-based programs if you're working with a college that draws students from other areas or states. The summer break lines up great, but the challenge can be if you're looking at summer match support contacts and summer match contact, um, college volunteers definitely can be a little bit more of a challenge, so you have to be prepared to really work with them through that. High school volunteers, they're also great if the school is nearby. Sometimes in your rural areas, they're shared campuses, so this makes it great for recruitment. If there's a distance, it may limit you a little bit with access to transportation. Um, but don't limit this group to after school. Consider a partnership with a high school and explore class schedules. Are there breaks in the high school student's day? How long is their lunch? Do they get out earlier in the day, like I shared with a previous story? Um, sometimes there's even a class or two that's open to this concept and will allow once a week to let the high school mentor be released to go mentor. Um, I've had a campus or two that has done that with me. So it's, it's really good to identify your sources prior to partnering with the school. Um, because it doesn't do any good to partner with a school that then you go out and recruit and you can't get enough volunteers to meet the need. So um, get suggestions from the champion. You can even get suggestions, additional suggestions once you meet with the school principal of other resources to connect with. Now we're going to dig even deeper. Um, this, again, may seem like a very basic element to a school-based program, but it is critical um, to be prepared with these answers when you go into a school site. And identify what your program is willing to or has the resources to support when it comes to match meetings. So, you know, think about when, what time of day are you preferring, um, or are you flexible around that? Are you looking at before school, after school, during lunch, during school? Um, which day or days of the week are you looking at? How often do you want matches to meet weekly, um, hopefully? Um, how long will each match meeting be? So consider the day schedule. Where might there be blocks of time? Um, I can share with you when you're working with elementary school students, when you look at a block of time that has recess included in it, they really are antsy about that recess time. The kids are. They really want to get out there and um, sometimes often would prefer to be out at recess versus being with their mentor. So really work through that and think through that as you design your program. 
Um, when will your program start and end? Because that's really going to impact the length of the majority of your matches. Where will your matches meet at this school? Is there a specific room that you're looking at, like a lunchroom, a library, a gym? I like to ask that question of the principal when I meet with them, because sometimes they even come up with areas that you didn't even consider or know that were available in their school. You know, like other rooms. Um, talk about can matches move to other rooms when they come to meet? Can they meet in different locations? Can they go outside if they stay on school grounds? That's great when the weather changes and it's really nice, or you have matches who want to do that recess time. What facilities or supplemental services are available? Can they use the computers when they're, if they use the computer lab? Is there gym equipment available if they're in the gym? Um, books and games in the library. Really great to ask those questions because when you get into thinking about what they're going to do with activities, if some of these options are available, that can go a long way. And your program doesn't have to put the funds behind it to make that happen. Structures of the meeting, um, do they all meet at the same time, same place, or are you looking at different times and different locations? And then, you know, kind of what, were they, what are they going to do together? Are there specifics that meet your program goals? Are you going to offer curriculum? Are you open to elements that a school would want to be sure that are included? For example, um, I've had schools ask me about adding some time for homework, adding some time for reading, or even test preparation. And that's some places where I've been flexible. and. Um, really reinforce them trying to build relationships and that not every time or not all the time would I want them to spend the whole match meeting doing that particular activity, but it's definitely willing to incorporate that in and definitely reinforce that with matches to spend time doing that. Sometimes that last part, you know, if you're willing to add some of those academic elements, that can be a deal breaker with you with the school. So um, talk through that, think about what you're prepared to do and uh, what you're willing to do when you go in with that. So I also want to think through who are going to be the key staff responsible for the mentoring program. And what will the support of the matches look like? Will you provide on-site staff person during the meetings? Um, will you need the school personnel to support match meetings? And what will that look like? I know there's a lot of school-based programs that have gotten school personnel involved, which is a great asset many times. Um, I recommend that you anticipate the need for more support in the beginning of programs to invest time to get a school program off on the right foot. Um, you just you want those first matches and those first interactions with the school to be really positive, really solid, and problem solving as they come up because it will pay off in the relationship. I know everybody saw the first one. Support needed from the school funding for the program. That would be idea. Um, but, but you should kind of think about what funding is needed to start and maintain the program. And, and schools are most receptible if you're coming to them to provide your program at no cost. Maybe you have a grant from somewhere else, or it's a school initiative that, you, you know, that your program is willing to provide. But don't close the door on that. Think about other resources that they might be able to provide from the school. Space is one thing that's important, and that really is an in-kind contribution. Um, as I talked about before, the library, so you could have access to books and games and computers. And a lot of times, schools have a little bit of a budget to recognize school volunteers, so maybe your mentors could be included in that recognition. PTOs often have some funds to support programs like this. Um, if you go to them and ask them for what you may need, maybe you want an activity bin or um, you want to supplement some gym equipment or outdoor equipment um, or some recognition for mentors. PTOs often will support efforts like that. And then you also always want to put on the table to ask the school to consider your program for funding and any grants that might come up and that you'd be willing to work with them to write in a mentoring component. You also want to decide what's going to be the role of the principal, the teacher, the school secretary, and or other school personnel. And I would say you want to go in being flexible with what your needs are here. They're all stretched for time, and many of them, as they downsize, some of the school personnel end up with multiple functions or roles on their plate. And so you want to be comfortable with um, asking for minimal that you can, but don't hesitate to ask for what you need. The other thing you have to think about is how you're going to evaluate your program and the information that you're going to need from the school 
um, about your mentees, the value program. I know many want to see grades and progress reports and things of that nature. So if your program evaluation is based on student records or teacher reporting, be sure to include this in your meeting and make plans in your timeline that will work. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Hey, Michelle, there was a question on this topic about um, in terms of educational outcomes, how have you been able to get access to student grades in order to show that mentor impact on academic performance? Um, as I talked about earlier, uh, I had a, a parent permission form that specifically on the permission form asked the parents for permission for the grades, the uh, student school records, including grades, um, maybe behavioral issues. That way I could have conversations with the school counselor, school social worker, um, about anything that might help support the match. You know, sometimes matches go through ups and downs. Um, so I got releases to talk to them, but also that parent permission form. Uh, and I would ask the schools, I would make copies of those permission forms for them to put in the students' records so that then they could um, feel comfortable with providing that information to me. Very good to have that conversation with uh, in your meeting as you're establishing that partnership so that you understand where that principal stands on release of school form and share with them your parent permission form and say, will this suffice for me to get information from, uh, from the school? And I can tell you in some school systems, that's very easy to do. Uh, I have worked with Detroit Public Schools, very, very difficult to get that information from them. Um, those grades don't always get turned in on, they get turned in on time, but they don't get processed into report cards very timely. Um, we actually used at that time a third party evaluator. So we had a grant for that. We included those costs in the grant. And again, even those evaluators that had been in and out of those school records um, had had, we had permission forms for those students as well. And um, even then, it took them a while to get that information. So um, sometimes your teachers might report that information out to you as well if you have those. But I, I hate to go to the teachers when they already have to submit that to a central system. And it's a lot quicker to get all of your students um, information from one person versus going to, you know, five teachers if that's where all your students are. So those permission forms are really, really helpful to get you through this part of it. Do those forms have to be cleared with a lawyer first? Um, I have not had them cleared with a lawyer. Um, I've, I've made sure that the principal is, feels that that suffices to release information. Um, if you feel like you're going to a school system where that would be more important, you, you can share those permission forms with um, an attorney. Maybe you have a mentor already who is one or someone on your board who would be willing to look at that language for you. Um, I'm going to share some resources with you later in the webinar that you also will be able to go to to see some templates of permission forms. And, and you might be able to start with something like that. Um, and a lot of times, just just word it for what you're looking for, and, uh, and that will get you to the place that you need to get to. So let's talk about the timeline. Um, and, and I'm going to share with you some, some time frames that I have always felt are the best timing for going through these particular elements of getting your program going, working with the school, because this is really, a lot of this impacts the maintenance of your relationship. And it's also important, I think, to let, um, if, the, if the principal or the person that you're meeting with wants to know the impact on their school schedule, they're going to want to know when are you going to be, when are you going to be bugging me for this stuff? When are you going to be, you know, working with the staff to get these things going? And so it's best to kind of have this stuff ready. Student referrals, the best time is spring before. So right now, if you are, um, if you're going out and meeting with a principal or a school or a new school, this year. You want to start them in the fall. I recommend that you get in and get with them now, or even if you have existing relationships. Spring is the best time to get student referrals. This is when the teachers have known their students for almost a whole school year, and they can tell you off the top of their head which students they feel would benefit most from your program. Share with them what, you know, go to a staff meeting, talk to the teachers, let them know what your program does, what your objectives are, and let them know that you would like for them to consider students they have in their classes now to be mentored for next year. Um, great time to get them. A lot of times it's rough going in the beginning of the fall in August to be asked, or September, I'm sorry, <laughs> September to be asking teachers for referrals. They don't feel like they know their students very well yet. 
and kids change over the summer. And so a lot of teachers feel, you know, I'm going to give this kid the benefit of the doubt. They've grown, you know, they've grown three months since the last teacher maybe gave me word of what they might be like. So um, again, spring is the best time to kind of generate referrals. Now, for student interviews, I would wait on those names until the beginning of the school year because many of the families end up moving during the summer. And so you don't want to go through interviewing all these students and then, you know, not be able to find them in the fall. So save that interview for as early in the fall that you can get them. Um, you can also wait to send those parent permission forms home at that time as well. That way you're getting the most current information about the student and you're also getting, um, you know, you know that that kid is actually at that school that year. Your mentor recruitment and screening prior to the school year's best, summertime, um, get, give yourself time to get the screening done. Get as many of those as ready as you can. And I've always, always been under the theory, too, is that our mentors, are, who are typically much older than our mentees, you can ask them to wait a month. And that's not a long time, necessarily, for a mentor. But where you interview a mentee and you ask them to wait a month, it feels like forever for them. So um, get your mentors in. Get them. You can start recruiting them even now. Um, but definitely during the summer, give yourself time to get that screening done. Your first match meetings, try to get those done as early in the year as possible. It gives you the longest match for the school year that you can have. Many of your schools, though, you have to consider meet. And I don't know if you've worked with schools or talked to schools around that time, but it's a frenzy. They are so focused during that time. And you'll hear that word constantly if you're trying to reach out to build a school partnership in October. Um, I would recommend you kind of stay on the peripheral, catch them before that or after that. Um, many school programs, unfortunately, in Michigan start in November because of me. So try to negotiate the benefits of mentoring and get started earlier in the school year. So if you have all your mentors already ready and you can interview your students within the first week or so of school, you might be able to have a compelling case to get that going. Match support schedule, think about that throughout the school year, what months it's going to take place, your frequencies, and how you're going to manage school breaks. And one thing to consider is a lot of school, a lot of school holidays are on Mondays. So if you have matches that are meeting on Mondays or your program's designed to be on Mondays, how will you plan to work around that for those weeks? You definitely don't want those particular mentees to, to miss out on the consistency that your kids who are meeting Tuesday through Friday are getting. If you're having special events or any celebrations, um, think about when there's, those are going to fit in the year. Reference the school calendar so maybe you're not piggybacking on some other major events that the school's doing. This is another place to know your school's culture. What's their stance on the celebration? Um, a lot of times there's rules and guidelines for, the, for parties or celebrations. Many schools have harvest celebrations versus Halloween. And um, some schools are specific about fresh refreshments that are allowed, no sweets, no red punch. So really make sure that you understand that. For your end of the year matches, um, celebrations, check the school calendar. Communicate that with your school early, because you may want to have that into a time where other things are happening. Um, but can also consider your mentor source. College mentors may end earlier than your school year. High school seniors might be hard to keep focused during the last month. Um, and you know, if you're going to do a work site field trip. And um, think, about, think about summer contact, too. That's really important to discuss that. And then closure process. Make sure you have one of those in place for these matches, if it's necessary, if they're not continuing on to the next year. And then evaluation. Be sure to start this early. Avoid the last month of the school year or waiting until school is done. Most schools, there's nobody in there during the month of July. In June, they're focused on wrapping everything up and getting everything closed. So anything you need from teachers, you need to make sure you have time to distribute and follow up. And check with the primary person who would get you school records for their suggested time frame. So if you want grades um, for the full year or the end of the year, talk with them about when the best time is for them to get that from them. Because you don't want to hit them during a time where they're trying to do their primary job. They get really frustrated about that, the records folks do. Um, I have started evaluations with teachers as early as February. And I know that seems really early to be getting an end of the year evaluation for these, but it has taken me that, that from February to April to pull that stuff in. And when you get to the end of May, you really want to give the teachers a break. They're trying to wrap up their classrooms. They're trying to do end of the year things. Then they're going to be into grades. And, and they really are not focused. Your stuff is going to end up on the bottom of the pile. There was another comment about the. Um 
understanding not wanting to meet on Monday, but it also seems like with the Tuesday-Thursday match meetings that everyone else also has meetings on those days, which seems like a um, pretty popular date. So do you have suggestions or other comments on that? Um, I would say, you know, if you have match meetings on Mondays and that's a great day for your program, is just come up with a plan for what you would do on the weeks where Monday is a holiday. So maybe that week your matches are going to meet on Wednesday. Um, if you've got flexibility with your program um, and you have individual matches meeting on Mondays, just have them have a plan B day, the day that they'll go later in the week to meet with that match. If you're having group sessions, um, think about what you might do and what flexibility you might have to do that. Or you may just say, we're going to have to live with this and this is actually how many match meetings we're going to have during the year, which might compel you to get your matches started even earlier so that they don't miss out um, as much as other programs. I want to share too, um, I'm glad that you brought this up. Um, if you're working in some of the um, inner city schools, you will find that Mondays and Fridays are the worst attendance days for the youth that you're working with. It just happens. I don't know why, but it does. Um, so that's why those, a lot of those programs are Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays, because that's when the higher attendance days are. Um, if you're looking at really focusing on attendance and trying to increase that, you can try to do some programming on Fridays and see if that will work or that will keep students there. But um, I've had some programs where we've done like a lunch program on Fridays, and it's been, uh, it's been pretty difficult. The attendance has kind of gone back and forth with some of the mentees, and, and that's very disappointing for mentors in the program. For those of us who love the programming part, the matches, the mentors, the mentees, this is kind of a piece that you cannot forget is some of the operational items. Um, really recommend that for your school-based partnerships, you consider having a memorandum of understanding, an MOU. And in this, you really want to outline the responsibilities for each party. What are the roles for everyone? What are the roles for the school, your program, the mentor, the mentee, the parent? Um, your program design. Have a general outline here, maybe frequency, what your screening is, what your support for matches is, and also your safety protocols. This is a good place to have that and share that with the school. Ask for what you need. Do you, have, do you need space for match meetings? Because um, you will find some schools are limited for space, but you can be creative about that. Do you need a liaison from the school staff to help your program be successful? And be sure to identify who that is and the specifics about their role. And this is a good place, again, you know, what will you do? Make a list of what you'll do and what you'll need from the school. Then we can't forget what the legal and liability issues are. Be sure you and the school discuss potential liability issues and agree how you're going to share responsibility. So some issues to examine include screening of mentors. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of school districts and the state has um, the state has a law right now about the screening of school personnel, but many school districts have also taken that and expanded it to that they will be screening in certain ways their, their volunteers as well that come into schools, and they will consider your mentors as school volunteers. Um, examine confidentiality, as we already talked about the permission forms and the release of student records. Um, student safety and mentor safety. Uh, agree on the protocol for reporting things like that. And then agree on insurance coverages and limits each partner should have and the procedures that will be in place for tracking and reporting any incidents. It's really important to agree on that. Are there any financial agreements that need to be made? So schools like mentoring organizations, they operate on really tight budgets. And generally, a school's contribution to the program will be in the form of in-kind donations, such as space for mentor meetings um, and materials and equipment to use during the meetings. However, the school might have uh, small budget amounts for events, such as mentor recognition ceremonies. And it might also consider budgeting a small incentive for a school liaison if you identify that you have one of those. OK, so you have all of that figured out for your program. Um, I know that sounds like a huge list, but it's really important to think through all of that, what your flexibilities are. Be prepared to answer those questions. So let's talk about getting in with the school, meeting with the school. Who should you meet with? Um, you'll want to be able to meet with the decision maker for the school. So be mindful. Every school is different. Uh, Suggesting you start at the top, and then if you have to um, or need to, have a, have a second meeting with the school with principal, the site that you're going to. Um, I personally made 
district-wide agreements with superintendents, but I've also just made agreements with principals. And I've accomplished a meeting one time where I had a superintendent, the high school principal there for mentors, the middle school and the elementary school principals all in the same room. It was a super meeting. I had to sell the program big, um, but I walked out with a uh, partnership with the whole, the whole uh, district. It was phenomenal. It was great. So getting the right people in the right place is important. Identify any connections your organization might already have to the school system or individual schools. Um, are you at a current school site and the principal can mention you to another peer? That's a great way to get a meeting with another school that you want to get to. Um, identify if you have that school champion in your mix already. We talked about looking at your current mentors, board members. Um, maybe even a parent might be in your mix already. If you don't have a champion, find one. Um, middle schools and high schools, you can sometimes look to a guidance counselor or a school social worker. They're a great place to start. And then also, it's good to get to know the secretary. They are a key player to the success of your program. Do not overlook that. They know most of the parents. They know many of the students. And that's because the students are in there in the office waiting to see the principal often. Um, and they, they know a lot of students your program is going to serve. And they know the flow of the school. They know what other programs are there. And oftentimes, they are the ones, they're the gatekeeper to the principal. They can get you that meeting. If you find that there's community partners that you're connected to that are connected to the school, don't hesitate to bring them or use them to kind of open that door for you to get into that meeting. When is the best time to have a meeting? Um, if you're planning on starting a program in the fall, right now is a great time, sometime this spring. Um, if you are planning into next year, you might be looking at uh, January or a time like that to bring somebody on. Um, understand you might have mul you might have to have multiple meetings to get your school into a program. We talked about maybe you might need the superintendent and then the principal. Um, don't hesitate to ask for a meeting with the decision maker and your champion. You'd be surprised just by calling what you can get. Um, and be sure to bring your key staff to the meeting. If you're meeting with a superintendent, you probably should consider bringing top staff from your program, maybe the executive director or the program director. And that might be um, your role might be the program director, you know, go right in, <laughs> have your meeting. Um, keep it short and sweet. Be mindful of their personnel time. Um, I've gotten meetings done as quick as 15 minutes. Um, they'll let you know if they're still interested and want to talk more. But, but you know, give yourself about 20 minutes and, and time for them to ask questions. Use your MOU as an outline for your discussion, your meeting agenda. And while you're there, get to know your decision maker. You want to build a relationship. So find out a little bit more about their personality, which will give you clues as to the culture of the school. Take note of their demeanor. How do they speak about their school and their goals? And how long have they been in their role? So um, I know this sounds interesting, but while you're in their office, check out, their, check out your surroundings. Um, check out what's in their office. Um, I was in a meeting once. This is actually not a success story necessarily, but um, it was a great meeting. The principal was dropping names of people that were on our board and mentors. Um, she signed the MOU. The downside is she took multiple calls during the meeting. The secretary had gone to lunch or run an errand. And um, what ended up happening is as much as I tried to like make those connections or keep those connections with her, it was really hard to follow up with her afterwards. Um, hindsight, I probably should have asked for another meeting at another time where she was um, could focus more on what we were working on. Um, but the other thing when you go into your meetings is be prepared to answer questions. That's why we talked a lot about program design. Be sharp um, and be concise. Be ready to be ready to answer those questions as they might fire them at you. Some other things to think about is selling your program. This is really what you're doing while you're having a partnership meeting. So if you have a success story, and maybe this is your first school-based meeting, go ahead and use one of your other match stories about the success of that. Um, if it ties to maybe that particular individual doing better in school, or getting along with their peers. Those are some great outcomes that, that principals and administrators really like to hear. Um, they know that that helps their schools. If you have data, or you know there's data out there about school-based programs, if you use data outside your program, just make sure that you state that, that that's coming from another resource. You don't want the, later on we'll talk about what you share back with maintaining your partnership. So you don't want to put outcomes out there that you're not sure that your program's going to accomplish, but if you know that there's been great results out there because of other studies, use them. 
but use them with some, some notation to that. Uh, speak highly about your program and the benefits for students, teachers, and the school in general. They really want to hear how that's going to help them. Important to speak about how many and which students you want to serve. And speak about where your volunteers are going to be recruited. Do you have some of them already lined up? That can really kind of move things forward. Um, be sensitive to the school's concerns about the well-being of their students. How are you going to keep their students safe? So what are, you know, what are some of your program ground rules? Mentor screening, match support, um, are you going to have on-site program staff? Those are all things that can really show to them um, that you're concerned about the safety. Get a sense of the school rules or guidelines for volunteers. That would be important for you to know if your program design and important for you to inform volunteers. Some districts have specific screenings for school volunteers. Some have specific sign-in rules. Um, you want to make sure that you're informed with that and you have that in your program design. Again, be flexible with your program design. It can help you adjust to fit the specific school. And I'm not recommending that you compromise your program goals, but just be willing to be a little flexible to get there. Again, use your MOU. Make sure you speak to the what you expect or need from the school, what your program will do, and make sure you have a shared understanding of the volunteer's role. I've had some situations where mentors have been pulled in two different directions. They've ended up um, not only coming into mentor, but being a teacher's aide. And you really want to make sure that that's really clear from the get-go. And if you can, have a prepared MOU ready for signing. I know that sounds like ready to seal the deal, but I've had principals who uh, quick conversation, and they right then and there were ready to sign that. So be prepared for that. Um, other ones, if they want to think it over, look at it, give them a chance to do that. I've had some even take it up higher in their organization. Um, I had one principal take it to legal counsel. Um, so I did make sure to emphasize to them, this is not a legal document. It's just so that if there are staff changes, that we can communicate those going forward and everybody understands what, what the expected roles are in our program. Katie, how are we doing for time here? We have about three minutes left. OK. Um, let's, move, let's move past this poll. And um, let me talk about some challenges to expect. And uh, we'll see if we can get through these last few slides quickly. Um, some possible challenges. Um, you want to get to the right, you're, you're trying to get to the right person to get your program started. And you may need to meet with a counselor and find out um, that you need to speak with the principal. You might meet with the principal, find out you need to speak with the superintendent. So, you know, try to start at the top and, and give the superintendent the opportunity to maybe pass you down the ranks. Um, every district is a little different as to who is the key decision maker for that particular school. You want to sell your program benefits. And sometimes this is really hard with schools because they're pulled in so many directions and they have multiple goals already to accomplish. So your program really has to ease their pain. So um, tie it into the academic achievements. Tie it into you know, less discipline issues and problems. I mean, do think about how it's going to ease their pain. And if you don't know what the school's pain is, it's OK to have a preliminary meeting with the principal and ask, you know, what are some services you need or what are some goals that you have that you're trying to accomplish? Um, school support. I encourage you to share your program at, um, at their staff meetings so that you can answer their teachers' questions. You can seek support. You'll even be able to see if you have more champions in the room. And getting good with that secretary. Um, you want to work through challenges with getting referrals and evaluations from teachers. And you really want to keep the paperwork down for them. So it's good to get a fellow teacher to share their own success. Uh, the students, once you're in that school and you've been mentoring students, or you might have a community-based program and in this class, there's a couple students um, of a teacher and she notices a difference. You definitely want to use those success stories so that other teachers hear that it does um, ease their pain in their classroom. It can be challenging for um, the school calendar to get those longer matches going. The meet schedule can be a challenge. You really want to think through that, work with the school about how you can get work through all those pieces in the breaks. Spaces for matches to meet. Some schools have had to consolidate, and space can be a premium. So be creative. If there's a classroom open during a match meeting time, um, hallways, offices not being used, great question just ask the principal. I, they've come up with some really creative things and places for 
uh, matches to me. And then staff changes can be the ongoing challenge. Um, your program and the school site. So this is where having an MOU, that's a great way to sit down and have a conversation with somebody and say, I just want to share this with you. This has kind of worked for us. Um, and, you know, be sure you get out there and meet new staff and introduce your program to them. So maintaining the partnership, that's as important as getting the partnership going. Um, communication, never enough. You can always always communicate. Make sure you communicate the positives. But be sure that you don't overwhelm the school administration. Don't zing them you know, an email a day. Um, but be concise. Um, check in with them um, during the school year to get feedback about your program as it goes. And I recommend that you do that in person. Uh, can't express enough. If you have problems, you know, it's so critical to address concerns that any of the school staff identify. Even if your program sees it as a common challenge for your school-based programs or your mentoring programs in general, um, you, still should, you still should address it and take care of it. And then it's really nice to circle back and let that staff who brought it to your attention, let them know your progress, where you're at, you know, how you resolved it, how you accomplished that. Recognize and celebrate your matches at the school and invite school administration to join your group so they can see the great, great work that you're doing. Attend teacher and staff meetings, um, share progress, ask for their feedback, and recognize your school liaisons. And it, as often as possible, have your program staff connect with them every time that they're on site. Appreciate the school secretary. Um, something for their desk with your program name on it is great PR for you, but it also kind of gets people asking or, you know, what's this all about. Your program evaluation, don't forget to share your results. Uh, great to put those in an end-of-the-year report, you know, your number of matches, your outcomes you achieved, shared in writing with the principal, the teachers and school staff, with your mentor resource, and then don't forget the school board and the superintendent. So it's important to know that your school administrators, they talk, they know each other, they even know each other across the state. And so how you maintain one school program can determine if you'll be able to make your program grow. So a quick question for every, oh, we're going to scoot by that one too. Okay, great. In conclusion, um, building a successful partnership element, you know, know your school partner, do your homework, um, consider your program design in depth and, and the fit for the school site, and have a really, have successful meeting. Be prepared and know where you could be flexible. And then maintain your partnership so that you have longer matches. I want to share some great resources for you. Um, there are a few sites here that have some great school-based mentoring resources. The ABCs of School-Based Mentoring, which is a technical assistance packet, that has some examples, I believe, of permission forms that you can look to. That's on the Northwest Regional Education Laboratory National Mentoring Center website. The US Department of Education, um, they still have their Mentoring Resource Center up and live, and there's some um, documents that you can look through and, and read through there. The School-Based Mentoring, The Big Brothers Big Sisters of America by Public and Private Ventures. Um, this is a great thing to read as you're looking in your program design and the outcomes um, that you're looking for. Then there's also the Mentor Consulting Group, and this is, uh, she calls herself the Doctor of School-Based Mentoring. This is Susan Weinberger's site, the mentoringconsultantgroup.com, and there are some great Great pieces on there. This two decades of learned lessons from school-based mentoring has some of the things that we covered today um, that you can think about as you're going into your school partners or your maintaining school partnerships that you have. And Katie, you'll be sharing this to, oh, there, you shared with everybody. Slides will be available at the end of the day. So if you didn't catch those actual websites, you will get those. Then um, you've also got Mentor, who is a national mentoring partnership. They have the Elements of Effective Practice and Toolkit. They're available for free download from their website at mentor.org, mentoring.org. There's a toolkit with resources. Um, it has forms. It has um, sample documents and checklists that you can use for your school-based program. And then there's a research and action series issue of school-based mentoring. That's issue number six. And you can find that also on the Mentor website. So if you haven't, um, 
We'd love for you to bring this information back to your mentoring program. What's your program strategies for partnership building with the schools? Have you thought through your program design? Um, have you done a little bit of homework to get in to meet with the right person to get the right thing done? Do you have uh, parent permission forms? Do you have memorandums of understanding and, and have talked through what you feel everybody's role should be in the program? And then also there's great resources on the Mentor Michigan website at mentormichigan.org. Um, and webinars on a variety of topics. And I do want to plug an upcoming webinar that is match closure analysis. So I'd love to have you join us May 17th at 2 o'clock or May 19th at 9 a.m. You can learn how your program can approach match closure analysis. It's a great way to look at how to prevent match closures in your program. We'll discuss closed matches and review what areas in your program to look at. Um, it can take a little bit of time to do this, but in the long run, it's definitely an investment that saves you time and gives you valuable experience and most importantly will help you preserve one of your most valuable resources, your mentor. And um, I will definitely stay on and answer any questions that anybody has. Katie, you want to give them instructions on how they can ask questions? Sure. Um, if you have a question, please either type it into the question log box. You may have to expand your panel on the side, so that's a little orange arrow that you can pull out and type right into the question log box. Or on that little one, there's also a little hand. You can raise your hand, and I will unmute you. Michelle, if they're not able to stay for questions now, is there a way to communicate later? Um, Do you have sure. your email address, and then they can email me, and I can forward them to you? Yes, I think that would be great. I know a few people told me they had to rush off to... Um, 3 o'clock meetings or their actual program was starting. So um, I don't see any other questions coming in right now. But like I said, if you do have questions, and uh, just email them to me, and I will forward them as appropriate. Thank you, everyone, for joining this afternoon. Thank you.